I was standing in Valens where we had a lot of lychee trees in Dehradun. I used to be sitting under the lychee tree and saying, you know, there are only two subjects. One is science, one is spiritual. And religion never made sense to me. But uh, here is somebody who thought the same. I mean, there must be so many of us who think the same, but I feel that we are in a time in the universe, on the planet, that people are coming together to help others to raise their consciousness. Religion was the dominant factor of society. You know, and then think about school today. Who teaches religion in school or spirituality in schools? But science is very big in school, by the way. Today is the science world. Uh, science started off about four, five hundred years of great expansion. And they produced all these gadgets which you are speaking and you are hearing very comfortable you are speaking. And we feel obviously science knows a lot. And then you have two pathways, you know. Science which always searches outside, measures things, designs things, can make things work. But then somehow it doesn't satisfy the soul. And uh, on the other side is spirituality we talk about, the Sufism which we talk about. It's like two pathways where somewhere religion was brought down and science became big. That's how our textbooks changed over time. And now today it's the world of science. So on one side you say have faith in God, you know, have faith. On some side you're saying, no, no, have proof for everything. You know, your science textbooks are teaching you that. So there's always this disconnect in the mind. But the interesting part is as we dig deep into all the scientific things you talked about, and scientists are discovering that the world is coming back to the same road. But they are not ready to accept the other side. They are not ready to accept a creator or anything of that sort because that sort of disturbs their control over nature. So what has happened is, imagine there are two roads which diverged and they came back. In the middle there is a divider which is a very tall wall instead of a divider. And they both are on the same road now. Today science at the level which you are saying and what spirituality is going towards in the same road, a wall in the middle. I think books like these are supposed to break the wall. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know. I open eyes for the. I think you've done a great favor. I also believe that, of course, I mean, you might think I'm really constantly talking about the universe, but the divine force works to you. And the divine force wants this knowledge to be scattered in the world now and to be accepted by people. Because you are accepted on a social level, you are in a very high corporate position. So most of the youngsters are going to be looking up to you for that. Uh, my first question would be, got you to write the book? It was 2001, where I actually had a dream. And you know this dream, uh, it's an early morning dream. And I imagined, and I was in the dream, and I was moving up and down and up and down, and I was experiencing all kinds of emotions as the up and down movement happened. Uh, somehow I even knew that I was some, something, some being who was going up and down. And suddenly this whole thing flashed back and I saw this cart moving along the... And I saw myself, I saw the fly on the... I was a fly on the cart wheel actually. And I thought, I'm not moving anything. Initially I was experiencing a lot of linkage to what was happening. And after that, when I saw the whole picture, I saw that the cart is moving anyways on its path. It was a shock to me when I saw that and the first experience and the second. And in a dream, like you said, in a dream you are part of the dream, you are completely absorbed in the dream. I got up in the morning, you know, everything was normal, but this dream went into the head, it remained. But were you the fly in the dream? Yes, that was the fly. Yes, which was going up and down. And at one stage I was deeply emotionally involved, and one stage I was completely seeing the reality in a different light. As an object. object. And this is where the whole story started. It's like a, almost like a message. You try to give it up, but it doesn't go away. It keeps coming back. I used to write a morning diary in those days. Yeah. And this fly will appear again and again. And you know, then I said, maybe the universe wants me to decouple this dream. I have to come yeah. to the base of this right. dream. And the more I thought about it, and you think about our lives today, as long as you're on the wheel in the emotional cycle of life, yeah, the happens. highs and lows, and you're so yeah. engaged, and at some stage you can see the person say that maybe I am not creating all this also. Yes. There are forces larger than us which are moving us uh, you know, forward and you know, you just realize and that's where the question of free will comes. Yeah, the eternal question <laughs> in everybody's mind. By the way, all scientists today, uh, large part, if you read mainstream science, yeah. they are hard determinists as Mr. Jyoti said. That is, they believe that there is no free will. Where I teach at the Quantum University, we have uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, who I really admire and honor. Uh, when he talks about 
very similar things. In fact, at the quantum university, everybody talks about beyond science. They talk about your kind of stuff. I mean, this book is something they would appreciate and I will show it to the director. It's, it's fabulous. It's far beyond what the average mind thinks and it's what the average mind needs to connect to now. And what you said was that, you know, by disciplining your body, you defy aging. I think it's a mind-body combination. So what do you say to that? I mean, what do you say about defying aging? I mean, well, how would you express that? Yeah. You know, I would say, uh, look at this, you know, some, I, I remember talking about this somewhere, you know, I think it was to my boss, the same person who, who ran the marathon. Okay. And I said, he said, look, this looks very, uh, uh, you know, limiting. Let me show like a fly on the cart, you know, then, you know. Small but then, it's much more deeper than that. There are, I call it like you peel an onion and you go deeper and deeper and bigger truths appear from there on. You know, first, from an ego-centered kind of a human being, which we normally are in our daily lives, you move to a stage of give up. You know, a stage like this where you say there are larger forces than me who are driving it. I am, you know, subject to much higher and I, I develop respect and gratitude for the larger forces which run, you know, that's the stage which most of our religious and spiritual uh, literature puts us to. Yes. And then there's the last stage to realize that this entire, entire energy and force is nothing at us, us only. Even that creative force is us, you know. And in Hindi uh, the literature they say, Alam Brahmasmi, or you know, I am God. So it all cycles back. But then you can't evolve from a stage of being an ego-centered person to a stage of complete give up to the last stage of being, and that gives you such power at that time that then you're no longer like a fly, you're much more, you realize that you are so much capable of so much infinity of potential that it starts to burst out of you. But the only thing is you have to let it, and no. that automatically controls aging, that controls every other factor itself. That's yeah. Another thing which I liked in your book was the external change reflects the internal change. I mean, that's what you talk about. How would you explain it to the audience, let's say? If you just have to talk about it. You know, the way, the simplest way to look at it is the way, whenever you try to root cause correct something, it corrects permanently and completely. You know, sometimes you say, I'm like going to stay off some sort of rich foods. And then you have, when the rich food appears, you are trying to prevent yourself from having it. You know, you are sort of, some of holding yourself back because you know it's bad for you. That's one type of correction which I call it like an allopathic correction. It's like an, uh, you know, it, it does not solve the problem ultimately. It just helps you to survive for that period in front of that attraction or that thing which is coming in front. The other side of the stuff is a root cause correct where you change so much internally that externally anything which will come into not have any impact. You don't want to have it. You just can't take it anymore. It just corrects uh, in a way from every cell of your body. Right. You know, I saw myself, I was a non-vegetarian person, I was, you know, many things which, and then this whole changeover happened for me. Suddenly all habits will drop, you know, like, I became a pure vegetarian. I, I mean, you got me guilty about being non-vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> but it starts to sort by itself. It's so surprising that you're not preventing yourself. Yeah. You don't have anything, you're not trying to solve. Solve has happened at some level, very deep inside you, and which comes out. So the solve is somewhere else and which just appears in the external world in different actions of yours which you don't, uh, you don't, you know it's coming from somewhere else. Right. So that's why I say the internal change is the most important yeah. and that is where I think the creator also plays uh, and once that play happens then it plays to the outside. The outside is just a, a, a tape playing out of something which right. is playing inside. That's the way I... Yeah. I have a thought that you would like to just get down to you know reading your book around the world and teaching people all these techniques which you've got a lot of them there and uh, have you ever considered this that you would like to do that instead of just being a corporate head? I mean, have you looked at it? Yes, definitely and I would say it's a, it's a process, you know, the thing grows on you, your yes. passion grows on you yeah. and it starts to reflect in your day-to-day -day working life to start right. with but more than that, uh, this is the first book like I said and this and the next book was ready in six months. Okay. Now I know in two, three months I can get a book out. Now I know how to do this stuff. Now it becomes a full thinking with a YouTube video series which yeah. I know. So you put all that together and then I go and you know one day the balance will shift and then like you say, yes, there are forces larger than you which yes. will take you forward. Yes. 
and he is not that I, I was just thinking, uh, you are in the process of becoming a, what they call a transformational coach. So, I mean, that's the way you come across from whatever I saw the book. The biggest learning which I got, as I thought more on the free will piece, was how much are we really open to the world around us, really open, and how much are we able to integrate and flow with it and take the power which it offers us. I mean, that I think was my biggest learning. And the sequel is already completed. So this is the whole thing. Now I'm realizing when the universe pushes you, nothing will stop. The speed at which starts to go, it's at its own pace. You know, you have to accept the universe as it is and, you know, completely flow with it. The person who will learn to flow with the environment completely will have immense energy and immense ability to contribute to the world. That's the learning I got out of writing this book.